wanted to share something with you. It's old news already. Um, some of you who are my faithful Catholic listeners don't think I'm picking on you or your faith. I am not. But I do believe that there is um, a good reason sometimes to uh, show people an error. <clears throat> this was breaking news in the beginning of December. And I'm reading from NPR, but I'll read you a clearer version because um, this article that I'm going to read from mm, has some issues that I don't think are in line with the actual uh, conflict itself. The headline, Pope Francis suggests changing the words to the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, okay. In an interview this week, Pope Francis criticized the phrasing about temptation in the Lord's Prayer. It would be great if he said the Disciples' Prayer, but the Lord's Prayer. The pontiff is pictured here at the Vatican in April, whatever. Okay. Pope Francis isn't pleased with the words to the Lord's Prayer, specifically the part about temptation. In an interview with an Italian TV network, the pontiff said that the current language of Our Father Prayer is not a good translation. In English, and similarly in Italian, the prayer asks God to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But, says Francis, it's not the Lord that tempts. Now, I've, I have gone around this tree a bazillion times. This is one I'm, I'm not going to give up, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that this article differs from another article because of the emphasis. But although this was not the, the issue, there's going to be a specific word that is going to come into question with the Catholic Church. What really bothers me is that suggests that some good folk ain't reading their Bible. Okay? And I don't want to hear about, oh, what God did in the Old Testament. And he doesn't do that today. God hasn't changed. And his way with man, that is, his way, has not changed in terms of how he deals with us. So it's really upsetting to me. I continue to read. It is not he that pushes me into temptation and then sees how I fall. Francis said in Italian, a father does not do this. A father quickly helps those who are provoked into Satan's temptation. So right away there we can know that we are mm, completely innocent all the time. I think not. Francis pointed out that just a few days ago, Francis Catholic Francis pointed out that Francis Catholic Church adopted a new phrasing to its Notre Père, our Father. The first Sunday of Advent, the Church wrote, a new translation of Our Father will come into force in all forms of liturgy. The Catholic faithful will no longer say, do not submit to temptation, but do not let us enter into temptation. Well, that's blurring a little bit and it softens it. And you might say, well, this enters into semantics. However, here is what's going on. It says here, an old Anglican theologian told the Guardian that any changes to the prayer's wording could pose some risk. The word in question is perasmos, from the Greek New Testament, which means both to tempt and to be tested. The Reverend Ian Paul told the newspaper, so on one level, the Pope has a point, but he's also stepping into a theological debate about the nature of evil. No, he's stepping into a theological debate about the nature and way of how God has revealed himself in his book. Sorry, 
you can't just make this all about evil. I'm going to put one footnote. Although the disciples' prayer, rightly translated, also should have deliver us from evil or the evil one, you could go back and say, therefore, kind of an ipso facto, it's related to the nature of evil, but we're not talking, we're not making this evil, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to return to something I've done before many times over. The last part of this, uh, it says, the National Catholic Reporter noted that even after decades of debate, the change went over fairly smooth in France. Mais certainement. Even if some parishioners mumbled the wrong phrase. Great. Well, that's one article. This is from another source. And here, quite frankly, is what is the nubbin. That kind of blurs it slightly. And I have a feeling that whoever was reporting may have glossed the article slightly because this is what is at stake. I'm just going straight for the jugular here. Proposals will be put forward to tweak the Lord's Prayer according to the Italian Bishop's Conference. Instead of reading, lead us not into temptation, the new version will say, do not abandon us to temptation. Now, I don't think I need to read the rest of this. However, there is one section here um, which just puts me on my head. The Lord's Prayer, also known as Pater Nostro, has been translated into hundreds of languages from the original text into ancient Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, but the words learned by millions of English and Italian-speaking believers are due to be changed after a 16-year-long research carried out by experts quote, from a theological, pastoral, and stylistic viewpoint. I like stylistic. That just really makes me feel like I am closer to God. Okay, I've done this before, but just for the sake of just indulge me, okay? So all these, that means that, that, means that every single scholar that I have referenced is wrong. It means every single book by some of the greatest theological, both Catholic and Protestant scholars, according to these people, wrong. Now, let me ask you a question. If you go back and you change the words, abandon us not, that actually kind of just turns the whole thing in a wrong direction. Abandon us not. Now, we have a promise. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. The disturbing thing, and I've taught on this so, so long that when, when this was first kind of came out, I thought, okay, this is the same old horse. We're going to end up at the same place. I've done this before. I started the last time I did this, and I'm going to do it again just for emphasis to tell you, some of you who just seem to go to the internet or you read the news and it just becomes part of your repertoire, and I'm really speaking to those people who, are, who have less time following me in the, the type of teaching that I do with language and are just newcomers and may be offended at my reaction to this very glib and I think very not just erroneous, but very evil mistake. And I'm not, I'm not even sure that it's a mistake on the part of the church because what this door does is it in many ways lets the culpable party, which would have to be each and every one of us, um, almost push the blame in another direction. Therefore, essentially negating personal responsibility and accountability for our acts or deeds. Genesis 22, after it came to pass, after these things that God did tempt 
Abraham. And I've gone over this before, that Hebrew word, Nasa, which if you go into the Septuagint version, you're going to find the word, and should find the word, Berasmus, unless somebody's changed my Septuagint sitting, unless the Catholics have attacked my Septuagint already. You know, I've probably got some closet Catholics in the church here. I love you. Just don't, don't touch my Bible. <laughs> so what do we have here? Kai, Igeneto, Meta, Tarimata, Tauta, Hothios, Iperasti which is our word, Berasmus, the E putting it in the past. After this, God did tempt. And you can go through, the examples are abundant. I've just, when I sat down here, tagged my Bible. That's not a one-hit wonder when the Lord was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness. Moses cried unto the Lord. The Lord showed him a tree, which, he, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. There he proved them. Berasmus, or Nasa, the same word. And the examples, just in this uh, in Exodus, are abundant. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them, Berasmos, Nasa, whether they will walk in my law or no. And the examples just keep going. If you take a source like this, the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, done by, published by Brill, and this is um, Kohler Baumgartner, and you look up the section for the word, Nasa, the Hebrew word, and this is basically putting together, there's probably, in terms of a reference, uh, Brown Driver Brig, um, there's another one by, um, um, I think it's gastro or, or the name escapes me, but, but they all say the same thing. And these are all the gold standard. So if you look at the translation here of Nasa, the first word next to the Hebrew is temptation. And then, of course, it'll go into um, when we look at the verb form, for example, in the PL, to put someone to the test. Now, think about the prayer and carefully picking apart the prayer. The word is not, this is, this is why it just, it's frustrating to me. The word in focus should not be perasmos, to test, to tempt, to try. But if you're going to go after a word and attack a word to make your case, they miss the boat. Lead us, lead, lead. That should be the word in focus. That singular word probably is a governing factor to understanding the prayer in its fullest. Now, how you get to abandon us not, first of all, that dumps hundreds, if not thousands of years of theology, including the Bible itself, where we are told the Lord is with us, Emmanuel. The Lord is present with his people. In the Old Testament, he was there leading them and revealed himself in a diversity of ways, cloud, fire, uh, all the different ways. Into the New Testament, he is revealed Jesus is the exegesis. He is put on display, no longer hidden. 
and we're told Jesus is with us. I spoke specifically about the cross and looking to the death that is the union with Christ that makes me risen with him to walk in newness of life. He is with me and in me and walks with me, which completely throws to the curb, as I said, hundreds of now thousands of years of, the, of theological teaching about our union with our witness with Christ. That should make some people pretty angry, but instead it says, and they, they mumbled through the prayer and, you know, like, is this, uh, you crank it up and let it go and hope that the right words come out, like some rote repetition that has virtually little or no meaning. And unfortunately, let me say this, the idea, abandon us not, that type of a prayer says, there is a possibility because of the, the grammar that I'm sure they are pursuing, there's a possibility that he could, which makes it extremely convenient when you consider, and I'm not pointing fingers at the Catholic Church and saying, ha, oh, look at what they've done because everybody sinned. Sin is in the Protestant Church, it's in the Catholic Church, it's in the home, it's in the office, it's everywhere. But how convenient to phrase it that way, and then we can live a little bit more, we can assuage our guilty conscience a little bit, because we can say when we needed God to deliver us out of a temptation, abandon us not suggest the possibility that he could. And as I said, how convenient if you, if you have been uh, accused of hundreds of thousands of crimes. I'm using this as, a, as simply a place to point, although I said everybody's guilty, there's nobody who hasn't sinned, but a, a place to point at hundreds, perhaps, no, thousands of cases of child abuse in the Catholic Church. How convenient to say that we can convince ourselves as we prayed that prayer in those words, the Lord didn't answer, and therefore, our foray into temptation could simply be justified because in that moment he did not respond. There's something very evil about that. And if you can't see that, I'm, I don't know what to tell you, but from the Old Testament into the New, and I've told you, <clears throat> there are many incredible references for Old and New Testament. I just happened to pick this one because it was the most convenient one on the shelf in front of me and uh, I would say quite trusted. This is um, Cisla Spick, uh, Theological Lexicon of the New Testament, Volume 3. Somebody might say, well, who are you? These people are holy men, scholars. I'm just nobody and I'm nobody in pursuit of the truth and not willing to succumb to somebody's interpretation that essentially leads me down a bad road. Me and my faith and my understanding about who God is. Now, I, I just read Genesis, Exodus, go into Deuteronomy, go straight through the Bible and you will find abundant ways where God and the, the the word is used, it's in black and white in your Bibles. Tempted, proved, tested. And it disturbs me because do you think that when we give the right definition of that word, as I've done many times before, why do you think it says, and God tempted Abraham, and I've said this before, to see what was in his heart. Now, God is all-knowing, and he sees the heart. But it's not enough to see the heart. It, it would have been the execution or the demonstration or the putting forth of what was in his heart. Essentially, what we talk about when we say acting in faith and hanging everything on that act of faith. Well, that had not yet been uh, put into black and white by the Apostle Paul who wasn't around then. So here we have God saying, and it says, and God did tempt Abraham. The purpose wasn't to see Abraham fall. The purpose wasn't to, ha ha, see, I knew he wouldn't do it. 
but it was to see what was in his heart and with a purpose, by the way, that what is in our heart sometimes is actually revealed to us like a mirror in committing his way to what the Lord had told him to do regarding his only begotten son, Isaac, being obedient to God's word, and all of this wasn't just mere lip service. Yes, sir, I'll go up the hill, I'll do it. And he could have just gone back into his tent and said, the heck with that. But the very fact that it says he rose up early and he and the lad and they went up the hill, we'll, we'll be back, went all the way through, including raising the knife high. All of that is part and parcel of God did tempt Abraham. And God didn't let him go through with it. Now, that's one form of temptation. The other form of temptation indeed does come from the devil. Why we look at Jesus in the New Testament when it says he, after he had fasted 40 days, was led into the wilderness by the Spirit and immediately was tempted there three times, not once, not twice, three times. And this temptation isn't something that we can say, oh, well, you know, under God's supervision, oh, this was the evil one trying to thwart God's purposes. So there are two forms of understanding this. What may be coming from God, a test from God, and that which comes from the evil one, that deliberate intention to get us derailed. That's just the way it is. You go to the theological lexicon under the heading of Piera, Pirasso, Pirasmos, Apirastos, and the translation of Piera, attempt, trial, testing, proof, Pirazo, to try, to tempt, Pirasmos, temptation, trial, testing, and then of course putting an A in front of it, A Pirastos, which would put it in reverse, inexperienced, not susceptible. To temptation. Gosh, there's a whole, a whole litany of things um, we could go off on the right there. But in classical Greek, piera means attempt, trial, experience, sometimes putting to the test. These meanings are retained into the koine. And there's a whole section here. It's, um, this covers the Old Testament usage, which is essentially what I just covered here. Two most significant instances of Pirasmos are those of Abraham, whom God tested by asking him to sacrifice Isaac. Are these scholars wrong? Am I wrong? Are these people right? Have we been confused? Mind you, this is the same um, governmental body that has confused the church for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the wandering of those chosen people in the wilderness, that is ex Exodus 15, 25. These trials are a sounding or a test that allows Yahweh to assess the quality of his servants. This purpose is mentioned endlessly. Now, I mean, I'm sorry. And in these type of books, I don't care which one you're going to pull off the shelf. I'll finish here, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to another book that's by my feet here. But uh, all of the New Testament pastoral theology emphasizes, after the fashion of the Old Testament, the preponderant role of Pirasmos in the life of believers. It occurs in various, in various periods with greater or lesser intensity. Um, sometimes it is most pronounced in the form of tribulation, painful and dangerous personal or social conditions that put everyone's faithfulness to the test. And here they are quoting, it's a strange uh, quote of First Peter in uh, some other version, I guess, because it says here, Dear friends, do not consider the fiery trial you are suffering, that you are suffering something strange. In fact, this perasmos is providential, is a test of Christian authenticity for the participants in Christ's sufferings, and its purification like that of metal in a furnace. I don't think I need to read any more, right? Because I think I've, I, I, you can 
find this probably online and read it for yourself. But if somebody said to me, well, you know, I'm one of those people that's never satisfied. You, know, you only read from one source. Here's another one. This is the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other Christian, early Christian literature, third edition, uh, based on Walter Bowers and whoever published this. Can't see it, I'll tell you in a minute, because I like to do that, because we give credit somewhere in here. Somewhere we will find the publishers. All right, it looks like Frederick W. Danker. It's based on Bauer's Greek, uh, I'm sorry, German uh, tomb, I think in various two or three volumes. University of Chicago Press. Muchas gracias. All right. And this is why I, I will keep doing what I do because you know, there will be people who will flat out reject when they see me doing a translation, even though I'm showing them and I'm showing you, I've said, I've, I've begged people, please go look for yourself. Don't just take my word. I'm, I'm not wanting you to look at me and say, well, you know, I'm going to take her word. That's as being as blind as the people who will follow these instructions I just read to you. But when I'm giving you abundant source and I'm telling you, go check it out. The reason is because if you've got an error that to me is really, it's not just an error. It's, it's going to sound a little bit immature the way I phrase this, but it's a fudging for a reason. If I can somehow change the meaning and blur it just a little bit, the idea of my accountability to God has now just gone poosh. And as I said, how convenient. Change what you will when it works for you because it will help you in the long run in your crisis, in your governing of your crisis. And I think that's more evil than a lot of other things. But from this, I'm sorry, from this here uh, lexicon, beginning with Piera, Pieras, effort to accomplish, attempt, trial, experiment. Um, then you go to Pierasmos or Pierazo. Um, and again, we're, this is important because this sets up the structure to where we get, it's almost like building blocks. To endeavor to discover the nature or character of something by testing, trying, making trial, putting to the test. And there are scriptural references here. In this particular one, it says of God or Christ who put people to the test in a favorable sense here um, with the scripture that they're, they're um, using. And also painful trials sent by God. Um, let me keep reading here. Okay, then lastly, to attempt to entrap through a process of inquiry or test. Jesus was so treated by his opponents who planned to use their findings against him. It's a different way of looking at it, but those people were driven by the devil. I put it into two camps. To entice into improper behavior, to tempt. Now this has a reference. Let's take a look at this. Okay, there were two references. So one of them, at least the one that I, and I'll find it. Um, I don't want to spend the time here looking, but they all say the same thing. Being tempted, temptation from without or from within. That can be an occasion of sin to a person. Um, let me go down to some references here. Um... On the difficult saying, ton pierasmon umon in te sarki mu uk, out of Galatians 4.14. Um, and, and it continues. Now, if you keep going through the definition, you find that it just is like building blocks. 
that ultimately gives us a clear understanding that it could, the word pirasmos could, could never be used in the framework of abandonment. I don't know about you. Maybe this doesn't get you going. Maybe this doesn't mean anything to you. Just say, so what? It's just a word. Now, I know many people who they recite the disciples' prayer and they call it the Lord's Prayer. Imagine, as I said, we're reading English, and I've said the English is not the best translation. But why do this? And go back to the prayer itself. And this is why I said to you, there's something just, I'm going to say irksome about this. Oh, it stinks. Just stinks. The question is asked. They, they ask him, they ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And he says, when ye pray, ye pray this. Our Father which art in heaven, I'm just reading the English, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I'll come back to that in a minute. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. But How could you make it say and abandon us not when it's not even there? And again, praying that prayer essentially... It's one thing, I'm going to say, like if you were on the battlefield, you're on the front lines, and faith is wavering, you say, Lord, don't abandon me now. But even that is not, it's one of those tricky things. You're either going forward in faith, or you're going in reverse. The statement might be, look and see all the ways the Lord has led thee. You put your lifespan in there, these 50 years. Is my life perfect? Absolutely not. In my lifespan of 50 years, um, before I knew the Lord, I can say, pretty messed up. God looks at that and says, you didn't know, or you didn't know any better, but then you come to know the Lord and you start learning, as I talked about those dark spots, that while you're in the world, in darkness, you can't see them, but the closer you get to the light, you realize, the things that I was worried about back then are absolutely nothing compared to the things I might worry about now, now that I know who he is and how he looks at me or what he's expecting of me as his child. And that's not an act of, I must be perfect. That's just being a realist. We all fail. We all fall down. Sin is in us. There is no possibility to say someone has been cleansed from sin other than claiming the blood of Jesus, and I say this on a daily basis. What did Jesus say to his disciples? You are clean through my word, because it was before the cross, before his death, you are clean through the words I have spoken to you. Remember the word for clean? Catharized. But that, ca that catharization process is not for today, and suffices that it will carry over to tomorrow like faith. Each day is a new day which brings new dangers, new faith opportunities, new temptations, new troubles, new trials. You get what I'm saying. So, to put these words, to insert these words in here, and as I said, the, the, big, the big thing is why did they not tackle the word lead? Lead us not into temptation. That's perplexing me, and I, I, I'm not going to try and pit my brain against these great scholars over here. But if there's a word to focus on, that will give you some food to think about. Some of you will go look it up. But then I ask you this question. If the prayer for us that Jesus says, when you pray, pray this, lead us not into temptation. But what does it say about Jesus after he was baptized? The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So there is a theological conundrum right there that cannot be fixed by merely altering a word 
we're fudging something to almost, as I said, assuage one's uh, guilty conscience or make it so that when something does happen, we can say, oh, well, the Lord must have not bailed us out then. Hundreds or thousands, and this is not just Protestant theology, because the books I've looked at contain both Catholic and Protestant and, go the extra mile, Jewish scholars or those greatest, uh, with the greatest knowledge in Semitic studies. So how you get to this corner, I don't know, but I thought I would share this with you because when people say, well, you know, I, I see you writing in languages or you don't write too much now, but you used to write a lot because it's important. It becomes foundation key words that without those key words being perfectly clear to you and to me, even the English blurs it over, you're going to end up with some man fixed theology that basically lessens our culpability, for I said we're all culpable, but it also essentially makes God, uh, in some ways, reduced down. It's a reduced down, not anthropomorphized, just it paints God as uh, impotent or less powerful. Abandon us not. We're not praying to Superman to come in and swoosh in and save the day. We're talking about God Almighty, omnip omnipotent, omniscient, who sees. And this goes back to the old argument. Why is there suffering? Why do good people suffer? I mean, it, it all ties into this. And I, I highly urge you to reconsider in what I've just done, why I have been focusing on the cross and specifically yesterday's message about the death, his suffering and death on the cross. Why? Because it is in that union and it's not some mystical experience that we understand suffering is, unfortunately, but it is part of the trip. It is where we understand more about our faith in our suffering, in our trials, in the things we must endure than when things are good and we're feeling blessed and we're in the land of plenty. So easy in the land of plenty to forget what it means to be crying out to God and simply asking for mercy. So um, hopefully that answers the question as to why I still am a person who is a person of the book and a person who will spend my days nitpicking over one word or the nuance of one word. And if it's all for the benefit of our understanding and not being suckered into a general populace of ideas, as I say, that must serve some ulterior motive. It must serve some other motive. It cannot just be for the good of people. There's something there, and I'm not a conspiracy person either, but this must serve some other motive that only in due time we might understand. In the meantime, I intend to keep doing what I'm doing. And I, uh, as I said, I have plenty of Catholic listeners. And I highly encourage you to get a simple word study or get a Bible like mine that has the key words where you can go and look it up in the concordance in the back. And then people say, well, that's a Protestant Bible and Catholics won't read a Protestant Bible. You want to bet? Tools for learning. Compare it with your own. Compare it with going back to the original language. And you, you'll see that there's... We're, I'm talking Bible. I don't know what these people are talking about, but it's certainly not Bible. Now, hopefully, somebody out there is going to say, you picked my interest, and although I believe what you're saying, I'm going to go check it out for myself. I encourage you to do so. Nothing to hide here. And probably be able to go to a, your... Um, you probably find this information online from reputable sources or go to your local library. They probably have reference books galore for you to pick off the shelf and knock yourself out with. So another one bites the dust. And hopefully uh, I've helped somebody along the way figure this thing out. In the meantime, I need your reservations and your commitments for 
this Sunday. We need those reservations to be bumped up radically. So I need you to get on the telephone, get busy. <laughs> This house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, worship and bow down before.